Hey everyone, Andrew here. Uh, this weekend was Nona's birthday, so we decided that rather than recording, we were going to bring out an episode that we hadn't been able to air yet. So I hope you guys enjoyed. This is part one. Part two will be tomorrow, Tuesday morning, depending on when you're watching this. Um, and then we'll be back to our regular schedule on Thursday. Three, two... Welcome. Welcome to the He's Wrong, She's Right podcast. Here with our special guests that we still haven't come up with a term for yet. We, we don't want to call people special guests. Everybody uses that. It doesn't, doesn't feel special anymore. Um, but this is my co-host for today. This is actually the man show. And the women, <laughs> the women are here for the clickbait. They're going to, you know, thumbnails will fancy it all up. People will click and they'll watch and then they'll see our ugly faces. And it'll be good. So, um be introduced. This is Eric Tanzi from the Failure to Stop podcast and his lovely wife, Hello. Ashley, one of their small army that they're, they're currently working on. Um, yeah. Welcome. Thank you, man. Thanks for having us, man. Uh, we, anytime we get to come down to Wellington, it's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> it's I'm not a, glad you guys had us. I'm happy to have you guys here. I actually feel so weird not having to move the mic in front of my face all the time. And <laughs> yeah, like, I know, right? I feel like what am I uh, So I was on a podcast like a week ago. And they did a, a podcast like this. And like for the first half of the show, I kept looking up at the mics because <laughs> I'm so used to looking at a camera on um, live shows. We were having a conversation. Um, I don't even know what it was about. It was just a sidebar in between recordings a couple of days ago. And I kept moving. I'm, we weren't even recording. But because we were sitting there, I kept moving yeah, yeah, yeah. the microphone. She's like, why are you talking to the microphone? I'm like, yeah, it's good mic discipline, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. Anytime I have a guest on one of my shows, I always have to like go over how to work the microphones. Yeah. But yeah, man, thanks for having us out. Um, let's jump right into it. I'm here. What do you have going on right now? Because I know that some of our viewers, all three of them, will know who you are. But <laughs> for the others, you have a lot more than three. I'll send it out to to, to our whole podcast Sweet. crew. Yeah. <laughs> they Thank love you. hearing they love hearing the backstory, the backside stories of what I got going on. So <laughs> then we'll have eight. Yeah. <laughs> your 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 crew will come over and they'll be like, These guys are kind of boring. Why did you do no. their show? No, I was on a show um Monday night and there were thirty four thousand people uh in the stream and all of the chatters in the stream were all like my fans and so the guy from Two Cops One Donut was like, Holy shit, like your fans are like mm -hmm. dominating the chats right now. Like, That's awesome. Dude, my, like the wolf pack, that's what we call uh the followers of the Failure Stop podcast channel. They're like Hardcore. We've done four or five meetups around the country, and we have like we did one in North Carolina, and we've done one in Cincinnati. We've done a few in Florida. But the last one we did in North Carolina, we had somebody from South Dakota, Colorado, two people from San Diego, two people from Montana, and the two people from Montana met on the plane, and they were like, "Yo, are you so and so in the Wolfpack?" And he was like, "I am." And it's like that's how close these guys are, man. We have people from Michigan, Ohio, Florida. And they stay for three days, man. So we have a, a pretty devout That's awesome. like, podcast group. Yeah, so we fans, really like them. They really put out. They <laughs> really put out, man. And they bring me gifts. Like oh they'll gosh. travel. Like we had one from Arizona that was a listener, and they were going to the Outer Banks and they flew into Raleigh and they came to our distillery and just brought like all these gifts. And still to this day, every child that I've had in the last four years, she has made a blanket for each one of them. So that is so sweet. See, this is this is one thing that I forgot to bring up. Typically, you know, as the hosts, we're supposed to get our guests something. Oh, I've never yeah. done that. Uh, I've never you? given anybody a gift. Actually, I mean, the Sorry. spread of food is, yeah, is this a gift is enough. Like, gift enough. Yeah. I'm super excited. I don't never get to, like, sit down. I, well, I went on the one podcast one time, too, and they uh, gave me a gun. And it was like a, a Glock, like a Gucci Glock. Nice. And that was their guest. And I was like, no. I went the whole podcast just, like, staring at it was like, yo, I can't believe they're giving me a Glock. At the end of the show, they're like, dude, we're just, it's like, it's just part of the show. No! Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they took it back. such an <laughs> asshole. Dude, move. I was like so bummed because the whole show, dude, like my face was just red, just staring at this gun the whole show. I was, I was like, I, that was back when I was on Drinking Bros. I was going to say, man, I would be, I'd be sitting there worried the entire time. Like, what am I going to say that's going to screw this up and they're going to take back their gun? <laughs> dude, <laughs> that's even worse. And, and, yeah, they took it back anyway. Back anyway. <laughs> well, I was looking at the gun too and I was like, yeah, gun looks kind of beautiful. Like maybe they just fired it once or something. Like I didn't know, you know what I mean? But yeah, that was pretty 
It was That's pretty. Shitty. That was um, and the guy on that podcast. I won't say the name of the podcast. This was like three years ago, and the guy came out wearing like a like an outfit. I can't remember what the. I think it was overalls with like nothing underneath. You know, like and he had like big man boobs like hanging out each side. You know what I mean? And I was like, yo, like what is this podcast I'm on? And uh, and it was hot as shit in their studio, and I didn't feel like safe enough to be like, yo, can y'all not safe, but like I didn't want to be like a diva, you know? I didn't want to be like, can you turn the, the air conditioner on? So I just like sat there, I was like sweat the whole show. Oh yeah, that was the craziest show. So how long have you been doing this? Podcasting, um, four or four years? Yeah, about like four, maybe five. Well, yeah, I guess five if you want to include that first year of. Yeah, yeah drink, well, COVID? well, Dream and Rose had me do like ten pilot episodes of something that never went out. It was a cooking show, a chef um, show. It never went out. Joe Puhak. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can't yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't wow. have been able to pull yeah. that name. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot that guy's name. But yeah, he I was still the talk chef. To, I still talked to him. Really? Yeah. No way. Yeah. I haven't talked to that dude in years. Wasn't he? He was also a, a cop. He was a cop. He, yeah. yeah, he was a cop. I don't know what he does now. He's smoking hot Latino wife. Oh, he does that's all the work. Right, I forgot about He's that. doing like, like investigation. He'll never say his wife. He says he always smoking, says hot smoking hot Latino, Latino wife. wife. Oh, okay. like, like, I don't know this person all the time, dude. All that that must have been like, yeah, so uh, what are you doing? She's for his wife. Smoking hot Latino I, wife. I thought you were yeah. just talking her up. I've yeah. actually never even met him in person. No. He's a nice guy. He's a really good cook. Really good. I bought the domain around when we were in Raleigh for that. For the NC State game, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a size for about that. I forgot. I saw your cooler. Oh, you should have brought it. Which cooler did I take? It was a shitty cooler, but you were all about it for like weeks. After. <laughs> oh no, no, no! It was because I had the the pork and the towels and everything oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, um, I still have it. It's clean. <laughs> but I forgot to bring the it. pork's not still. <laughs> I think I think it was this also a chair that got left. No, I did get my because I have both my Michigan chairs, and those are the ones that I would have taken. I don't have chairs. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, a towel is a beach towel. Gotcha. I mean, like, that's when I started podcasting was with all that. And then it got turned into that tailgating show. And then I did tailgate legends for a year. And um, that was on the Drinking Bros Network. And then that's when they gave me the Felt Your Stop show with Mike the Cop. And then I've been full time podcaster ever since. So but I do five shows a week now. So it's a good for you. And then I'm a guest on two or three shows a week, usually. Remote or? Um, sometimes, like, sometimes I travel. Um, if they invite me, and then other times I just do it on um, the the screen stream yard or something like okay. that. But like OAN, uh, uh, one of American News Network, like they were, I've been on their show a few times. But they'll like fly you out to San Diego, but they also give the option to do it from home. And, like I'm not flying out to do an hour show. Because when you do shows like that, like you'll fly out, they'll pick you up from the airport, you'll do the show, and they'll drive you right back to the airport. Okay. Wow. So that's a long day, like yeah, I, six hour flight out, two hour podcast. What are you going to do for your uh, book tour? Are you going to, do you have a bunch lined up already? Uh, so I guess like the agent and Nick Palmashano, mm -hmm. um, they kind of are in charge of that. Mm -hmm. So I know that I got a really fat bonus though, which was pretty cool. And I guess that's to pay for all the travel, the but they're sorting that money out now. Okay. I, sh I should premise. Because I do know some stuff that you told me not to say. Oh, but oh no, he's fine. I mean, I don't know, like, yeah. I mean, there's some things that they're not out yet. But like, they, we could say the name. We can yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Pig Latin, a seriously funny true story. Signed a major book deal with a big publishing house that we're not saying the name of the publishing house right this second because we're, um, well, I mean, we're going to tell the story eventually. I won't say their name right now, but basically the editor is in San Francisco and says that the book makes cops look too cool. What? Her exact words. And she's not going to edit the book. So now we're contracting our own editor through one of the largest publishing houses in the world. And they have an editor that's refusing to edit the book because it's too pro-police. Even though it's a comedy and it makes fun of me, the whole book. Like, it's literally, as Nick Palmashano, my co-author, says, like, dude, it's almost like to a full, like, he's like, I felt bad editing the book because like I feel bad for you because you make yourself look like such an idiot and I was like yeah but that's funny and I like making fun of myself do you have to jump through the same hoops like anybody uh, does with like DOD to make sure no I didn't have I mean I had to go through legal mm -hmm. like a legal process 
But I changed everybody's names in the book and I changed the street names. They're real street names. I just like mix them. So like if it happened on Bart Street, I would say it happened on the adjacent street. So that way if anybody wanted to like look it up research, because yeah. you know, I changed the victims' names and the suspects' names. Um, and some suspects I left enough clues because they're shitty gang members and they're high ranking gang members that yeah. you know snitched. And I kind of want people to know. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I left enough clues, not enough that they could go and kill the dude. <laughs> But enough so they could be like, I bet you it was him. Yeah. You're just saying that to cover your butt. Kind of. <laughs> but I mean, I could care less if they would track that right. down. Right. Sounds like you actually want it to happen. Sure. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll say it. Yeah. Didn't, didn't some I mean, I'm not going to say like I'm all for vigilantism, but like if there was a Batman, I'd be on his side. Okay. You know what I mean? Got it. Right? Would you not? No. So Do you not watch the news sometimes now. and you're just like, dude, I wish somebody would hit that guy with a car <laughs> on accident? So, Casey uh, Anthony. Uh, Before yeah. we really dive into it, I tried to cover up the labels, okay. but um, Ooh, nice. We'll start off with the screw top ones because I didn't bring the course over. Because ah. ah. we got we got four or five screw top. Course, yeah, four four <laughs> screw tops. So it's dirt inside kids. Yeah. So um, I tried to put sticky notes, but they're still see through. For those that don't know, Tansy's a sommelier, so we figured we would extort him and learn something from him. We're not really extorting him. He's- it's been a long time. So I'm a certified specialist of wine and a sommelier. So, but the certified specialist of wine was like a harder diploma to, to get. Really? So, like, mm-hmm. I always like to start with certified uh-huh. specialist. So, I'm like one of like at the time I was one of 600. I don't know what that is now, and I'm not part of the really the Society of Wine Educators anymore. Um, not because I have a problem with them. It's just sounds I like have five cult. kids. Sounds like a cult. <laughs> yeah. No. So yeah, it's but a society, with yeah. wine. It's so. like yeah. they educate, um, like basically sommeliers. And so you can get hired to work at different wineries. And, uh, but I mean, you got to know viticulture, viniculture, winemaking process, red wine, white wine, sweet wine, fortified wine. You have to know all the theory behind wine, wine regions, soil types, acidity levels. You have to know wine faults. You have to be able to taste the flight of wines and say what's wrong with it. As in like, you know, maybe the cork tank, maybe like a loose cork or, um, you know, maybe there was uh, like a Britannomyces uh, leak in the, in the winemaking process. And that's what's causing these aromas. So you got to really know, your wine and and then you're expected to know wines like north to south in every major wine region so you should be able to taste a wine and within 70 percent be able to tell 70 percent of these questions where is it from how old is it how much does it cost what are the grape varietals so if you added all those together and you got 70 percent of those answers right is what you're expected as a csw and this is before or after you were caught um, I got it while I was a cop. Oh, okay. um, I started studying wine, though, about 18 years ago when I was in the military. And then I got out of the military to be a wine salesman. Realized really quickly I was a terrible salesman. <laughs> and um, and then I broke my leg. And my wife was like, You're, I broke my leg fighting a murder suspect. And I was in a bed for a couple months. So I really broke it. And my wife was like, okay, well, you're not going to sit here and watch porn all day. You're going to find a, I'm uh, oh, just kidding. I wasn't watching, <laughs> I wasn't watching porn. Um, but she was like, dude, you're not going to sit here and play on the computer all day. Like you have to find something to do for the next five months. And um, she was like, I'm going out. And when I get back, you'll have found like some kind of hobby. I don't care if it's like puzzle making or like whatever it is. And they're like, call me, I'll buy you some puzzles or some books or whatever. And she left. And like, I remember that I was like, there's no way I'm doing a puzzle for five months. That sounds <laughs> Terrible. ridiculous. So uh, I spent, you know, upwards of a thousand bucks, I think, enrolling myself into the Gala Wine Academy and signing up for the Society of Wine Educators test, which is like you have two years to take it from when you sign up for it. Okay. And I don't know, like you can ask her what her reaction is when she got home and found <laughs> out, but um, so what was your reaction? I mean, I was super pissed. <laughs> How dare he spend a thousand dollars without talking? Exactly, to like he was on like workers' comp because he had gotten hurt at work, and like I didn't work because we had right. uh, two children at the time, yeah. to stay at home, and you know he was kind of like a little bit loopy. I don't think you were. Yeah, you were still like on some <laughs> pain meds, and he's like, "Yeah, I spent a thousand dollars signing up for a wine class." <laughs> what do you think my reaction would have been? <clears throat> you would have just turned right back around and left again. You. <laughs> would have done the look and then you would have gone into that room over there <laughs> and shut the door in a way that I knew that I wasn't supposed to follow you. <laughs> and then four days later, it would get brought up and you'd be like, 
So let's talk about how you didn't buy me this <laughs> nice thing that I wanted. <laughs> so ours was like, she was like, so you have to pass. <laughs> and like immediately she went back to the store and went and bought me some wine books. And she was like, dude, you're going to have to go all in if you're going to pass this test. And I'm like, I knew I was going to have to. It's a 70% fail rate. How um, much money did you spend on the wine? Uh, I got sponsored uh, by a wine shop called Wine on Main. And I like basically did all their wine tastings and I did their wine buying. So like I would meet with uh, wine reps for them two days a week and figure out what's a good vintage, what's a good price, how many bottles we should buy, how you're going to sell it, who you're going to sell it to. And so I did that for, for that wine company in exchange for why to say with. And the cool thing was, though, is because I was meeting with reps, the reps would also just give me bottles for my rec, like to get me to either blog about it or to push it in the wine stores. And I do wine tastings at the time I was doing, you know, once a week, twice a week. Mm-hmm. Plus I was doing wine classes. And this is all with the broken leg. No, this was like pretty much after the broken leg. Oh, okay. When I okay. like started really studying, I mean, because it took me like a good two years to take that test. I, I took it two years after I signed up. So. Okay, okay. But um, yes, yeah, so that's where I got all the wine to study. Add, add this to my list of inadequacies. <laughs> I know I know about as much about wine as I know about trees. Yeah. Or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Wine. Sure. Same. Yeah, I think <laughs> that like for wine, it's like reading. And when you go to a wine store and you don't know anything about it, it's like going to a bookstore and not knowing how to read. You see all these like really cool books that look cool, but you have no idea what they're about. And you have no idea if you're going to like it. You're literally judging a book by its cover, which is like, a, I mean, imagine if you couldn't read and all you could do is pick a book out and have somebody read it to you mm-hmm. by, based on the cover. I mean, you would miss, I mean, what, what was that one book that you like? Uh, Pillars of the Pillars of the Earth. Pillars of the Earth. Like that's a terrible book cover. Like it's not flashy. It looks like a Bible. I would never, ever want to read a book that looks like that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's one of our favorite books or whatever. So, Are you familiar with uh, the Dunning-Kruger scale? So you have on your uh, x-axis or y-axis, which are all in the vertical. I don't even know. I'm too dumb to remember. Um, you have uh, knowledge. Yeah. And then on the other one, you have experience. Yeah. And so you have people that are confident that they know everything until they are exposed to it. And they're like, Oh shit. And yeah. then you hit the Valley of despair <laughs> as you gain a little bit of experience. And then you kind of work your way back up as you have experience and knowledge to yeah. bring together. Where do you think you are on that scale? I mean, for wine, mm-hmm. is that what you're saying? Yeah. Anytime you start to think, you know, something about wine, you realize really quickly, you don't know anything about it. So, I mean, it's wine is like one of those things you could, and that's why I've said like it could be really good for people with PTSD. I know that sounds weird, and like nobody would ever pick that up. Mm-hmm. Like veteran suicide was never like pick up being a sommelier or a wine guy. But like for me, it's one of those impossibilities. It's like one of the, it's like being in the special forces. Like when I went to selection, you know, I went. One of the reasons I went to selection was because everybody said it's impossible. It's like super hard. You're probably going to fail. I like to do those things, you know. That's why I open up a distillery. It's like the hardest thing to open out of all the beverage uh, industry, uh, like as far as like breweries and wineries go. But there's only 250 masters of wine in the world. There's only 250 people since like the 70s that have ever passed the master of wine exam. Wow. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people have taken it. So I already know what's on her mind. How frequently do you guys go to nice, fancy galas and events where she could dress up? Because that's that's what she's thinking right now. She's like, we used to. That literally <laughs> didn't even cross my mind. Uh, yeah, I mean, we used to. Yeah, we used to. Four kids we ago. To, yeah, four kids ago. We did go to a lot of galas, and I got to do this private sommelier for some really high end people. That was really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of cocaine in that industry. Uh, <laughs> like the richer yeah. the people, the more cocaine there yep. is. So that was, and I was a cop at the time. Mm. So it was really awkward. And I mean, I'd be like really, really high end people that you would know who they are yep. and your listeners would know who they are. And you would never think in a thousand years they would do cocaine. And we'd be at a really fancy gala and they would all be in the Escalade taking a bump before we'd go in or like, and, it, and that or was in the bathroom or in the or bathroom. In the bathrooms. Yep. And I was a cop at the time. So it was like very awkward for me because I'm like, did they know? 
but I wasn't working as a cop. I was working as a there. Right, right. Then, no, so I, I like turned a blind eye to it. Yeah. But like it was really weird at that time. Does it matter if you're not in your jurisdiction? Like if I was in still... my jurisdiction. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Like these people would come to Raleigh for maybe they came in for a football game and they wanted to hire a private family for the night, or maybe it was one of the Triangle Wine Experience nights mm-hmm. or something like that. Or you yeah. know, like I'll give you an example. This, this person did not do coke at all. This was an amazing person who supports police, but they own FedEx. Like they invented the. Uh, FedEx thing that you sign for boxes mm-hmm. and they're like probably like one of the top 20th wealthiest people in the United States, just wealth beyond imagination. And they had a private wine night and I was their sommelier. And then I got to do a cop thing with them and they invited a bunch of cops for a sommelier night. And that was really cool at this like super, really nice restaurant. And, um, and they were like, at the end of the night, she was like, Eric, if you could have one bottle on this list, like, what would you pick? And I was like, like, what do you mean? Like, well, if I could just have one, just money wasn't an option. And I didn't, you know, she was like, yeah. And I told her which one I picked. And she was like, can you guys grab that bottle? And it was like this, Expensive. like 1998 Chateau Pop that was probably like $3,000. I mean, I don't know what, what the price was. Like the price wasn't even on there. But I mean, I, if I had to imagine it was at a restaurant, it's probably like $3,000. Yes. And you guys got to enjoy it in the privacy of your well, hotel. Well, well, no, we, we drank it. And I was right pregnant, there. so I didn't get to try it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, she tried it, but remember the lady like got really bad at you for trying it, like some other lady at the table. I thought yeah. she was giving it to you as a guest and like here. Thank no, you. she was like asking for a suggestion. Ooh, no, for she was just table. like for the table. Yeah, got but I mean, I got to have a, a glass and just like I kind of climbed. But yeah, it was, it, being in the wine world was a lot of fun. Um, but like I said, like it's. You know, there's only 250 masters of wine. I'm not one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, my goal was to be one. Realize if you have kids or a wife, it'd be very hard to do that um, because you have to give up everything to do that. I mean, like your whole life has to be consumed by by wine. But you know, working my way through the the uh, quartermaster sommelier process and getting you know your level one, level two, or doing your CSW is so good for like PTSD because you don't even really drink the wine anymore because you're studying behind it you know if you know the history about of wine and the history could be like the civil war like the lebanon uh, the seven the civil war going on in lebanon or like uh caesar moving the gulls out through uh, france down into germany and stopping their campaign to grow wine in burgundy you know, like all these crazy stories that come out of it did you know like hitler uh like the reason why france allowed hitler to take Hair is so easy is because they put all of their assets and dug all their trenches and spent all their time fortifying the vineyards and the wineries so they could just go straight through because those wineries are so iconic and they're so old, thousands of years old. These, these cones can't be recreated. I mean, we're talking like Roman era grapevines and you know, the grapes of champagne, the grapes of Burgundy, the grapes of, well, Bordeaux doesn't count, but um, because it's not really on the way to Paris on the other side, but um. All of those uh, wines through there, they didn't want the Germans to just destroy them because they are literally probably the most important plants in existence. So do you think, well, and I guess maybe you would know from studying it, but did did they have the confidence that they were going to continue selling and producing or were they just hoping Totally to live. I mean, they were hiding wines. Like there's a really great story where these Germans were um, out on a walk mm-hmm. and they saw this pond and the, the pond was covered in paper. Like you couldn't even see the water. And the Germans were like, what is this? And what it was, was like the French had taken like one of these most iconic wine wines from Burgundy and sank it to the bottom of this pond, just as many bottles as they could. So the Germans could say, so because Hitler was stealing the wine and they actually formed an American and French unit that hid themselves. French spies hid themselves in wine barrels, got on a train, shipped their asses over to France. I mean, over to Germany, got out of the wine barrels. And because they were trying to hunt down where all this wine was going so that they could get it back. Like, wow. could you imagine if they were like, hey, uh, you're being recruited for this new military operation? <laughs> to get back wine from Hitler. Operation wine. So they were yeah. sinking yeah. these yeah. bottles wine. of wine into this pond and all the wrappers loaded up oh. and covered the things, but they were buying dust. So they, at one point in France, there's a great book called wine and war. It's all about this. And it's all about the POWs making their own wine. And it's, it's a great book, very quick and easy read. But uh, 
one of the other stories in the book was that they were these winemakers were going into the towns and and taking people's rugs back to their cellars, building false walls, putting the wine behind the false walls and taking all the dust from the rugs and trying to cover the new bricks and all this dust from these rugs. And they were trying to like make fake spider webs and everything so that when the Germans came into their cellars, you know, they could protect their right. you know, most valued wines. That's there's, really interesting stuff, man. Like we, there's a really fun bottle of wine. It's called Chateau Moussard. You can find it in a lot of wine shops, but I don't remember right now what that vintage was. It was probably like 2012 or 13. I can't really remember, uh, but you could go back and look it up. But those grapes that were in that bottle, and this is 23 bucks, but that vintage, like four people died picking the grapes because there was a battle going on. And they were like, fuck it. We're going to pick these grapes anyway. While the Lebanese civil war was like shooting across the vineyard. And four of these wine pickers died oh my gosh. picking the grapes for this vintage. So Jeez. a lot of people will drink this bottle of wine and like not know that story. And they might even say something negative about the wine. Like, Oh, it's not my favorite or something like that. And you're like, bitch, <laughs> like, died four people it. fucking <laughs> died making that wine. And you know, that's why I have like a real problem with, telling you if a wine is good or bad right. because I think there's a time and a place for every wine and it's the story that goes behind it. It's the occasion that you're enjoying it on. I mean, my wife and I got married at Hinnett Vineyards. You know, a lot of people stuck their nose up at the time. Like why would you go to a North Carolina wine vineyard for your wedding and have sweet wine at your wedding? Like, ooh, or where whatever. And we're like, it's out near where we live. It's like near Duplin. Super okay. um, tiny. Yeah, it's yeah. Muscadine sweet wine. Yeah. Okay. And but we were like, you know, we're in North Carolina. We're having a North Carolina traditional wedding. Our kids are going to be born here in North Carolina. And we want to enjoy with native traditional North Carolina grapes. Because I don't stick my nose up to sweet wines. And like, by the way, unless you're like a size two, don't ever fucking tell me that you don't like sweet shit. Like, <laughs> bitch, I fucking know. And that's like as a sally, it'd be we'd be like, I just don't like a sweet wine. Because I just, I just, I'm not into sweets, and I'll be like, <laughs> I wonder what the, bitch. <laughs> what the woman at Bridgewater was thinking when I was rambling off all my moronic, probably sounding criteria like this. <laughs> I mean, if you know something about wine, and anybody's asking you a question, you're excited. Right. It's when you aren't, when you don't know anything about wine, and you're working at a wine shop, and you're like a poser. That's when you stick your nose up to fucking people. But like when you know a lot about wine and mm. anybody that has like a general question, you're like so excited. You're like, finally, like all oh, this wine. knowledge I get to share with you, you know, like I get to get you excited about drinking wine. Like, let's go. The extent of my knowledge is I pour it in a glass yeah, and I like it. Uh -huh. I'll drink it. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's about where it goes. And you know, that's, that's a really fair assessment. Yeah. yeah. That's a fair assessment. So like for me, I want to know the story and it's more about the story or the occasion, right? Like, so if you invite me to your house on this podcast, I don't know what this white wine is right here, but like, I know I'm never going to forget it, right? Right? Because I had it here, you guys' first podcast in your house, your new house. Um, you have this awesome spread of charcuterie and accoutrements. If that's the right word. Uh, is that the right word? I'm still a C minus student at best. <clears throat> I um, I'll never forget it. I'm I'm probably a, a B student, but I yeah. got A's because yeah. I was a very good test taker. But on some of that, I didn't do the work, didn't care. I just was, uh, that that looks like the best answer. Didn't actually sure. know the knowledge, just, yeah, that right. makes sense. Yeah, with wine, you have to know. Like, yeah. there's not, you know, you can't fake it. If you do a blind tasting, you can't fake if you know that wine or not, because they're going to fucking tell. So it's crazy. And it can be very, it can be very nerve wracking, especially when you have a large group of people and they bring out like wines and brown bags and they want you to guess. And you just taught them a whole class. You can't. Yeah. Not win. Yeah. You know, you can't completely fuck up this wine. So you got to be on your shit, man. And, and, and dude, it's been how many years since I'd taken that exam or been in the wine world? It's been like, I think it was 2015. 2015. So we're all talking almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm still expected to know yeah. everything still. Like anytime I'm around anybody at a restaurant or anything, they're like, okay, we just ordered this glass of wine. Don't tell them what it is. You know, and you got to be on, you know, you can't perish yourself. I wonder, I wonder if that'll be. Cassius thing when he's older. He's the youngest, knows everything about World War II. Everything. That's oh, awesome. cool. Yeah. You could you could name a, a ship, he'll tell you the battle, he'll tell you the commander. You could talk about a specific location in Germany, yeah. and he knows what units were there. He knows 
the story. He knows what got them there. His favorite movie is Inglorious Bastards. Oh, he's great. eight years old. Good. That's a great movie. Yeah. Great eight-year-old movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and that's you know, I say the thing about sports commentators. You know, to know everything about all these different teams and batting averages yeah. and yada yada. I mean, it's kind of the same knowledge, you know, except for wine, it's in different languages, right? And it's in different places, and that makes it hard to study. What do you think is the the most difficult factor? So, for example, and I'll just I'll tell you this right off the bat. Um, all of these are, I think, with two exceptions, they're all the same wine, but they're from different parts of the world. Okay. Is that That's super fun? Is that easier to mm-hmm. figure out, or um, is it? It's just more fun. It's just a different uh, way of doing it. Like you can do it all, all sorts of ways. Like I prefer to do that. I mean, you can do it like, hey, this is the same grape variety. One of my favorite things, if you're learning about wine, mm-hmm. I'll always say like, let's just say you go to the store to buy uh, uh, Pinot Noir or Merlot, whatever. I'd say buy a Merlot from California for twenty five bucks, and then buy a Merlot from California for ten bucks. Open them both at the same time. Or them in two different glasses, taste the $20 one first, taste the, or, or vice versa, whatever, taste them both first, and then know the difference. And like you will instantly know why one's $20 and why one's $10. If you drink the $10 one first, the whole bottle, then the $20 model is, it might still taste better. I mean, it's just your palate kind of gets fucked up a little bit, you know, right. when you drink a whole bottle of wine. I knew enough to bring water. Yeah, I knew yeah, enough water to bring a ball to pour everything into because yeah. I probably got all terrible wine. I don't need to spit it on. That's not a slide to Bridge, Bridgewater. Is right. Yeah. The the woman that was working there, she's great. The owners of the place, they're out of the country, probably at a winery somewhere. Yeah. I think they were in South America or something. And you could do like New World versus Old World. So it's yeah. like you could take one grape varietal from the New World, California, mm-hmm. uh, Argentina, Chile, or something like that, and then take one from the Old World, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany, and then like try to figure out which one's which. That's always fun to do too. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways to taste wine and enjoy wine, but yeah, that's a great way to do it. So hit wanna, it up. I'll wanna, tell you where they're from. Want to break into it then? Go ahead. Who pours? Huh? Who pour? You pour it. I don't want to, I don't try not to look at the uh, bottle at all. I don't want to see any hints. Should I be, should I be cracking the other ones open to let them aerate or is that? No. Is, are they necessary? white? Yes. No, they don't need to aerate. Don't really have to air anyway. We're we, learning we, something. We literally know nothing about We are about uncultured wine. swine. Uncultured. I, know, I know I'm supposed to put my thumb in the plug. No. You're not? No. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Only thing I'd say, the only rule that like offends me, but it doesn't really offend me, is I don't like it when people grab a wine bottle by the neck uh, because a wine bottle, I don't know. And like, then what, just, just string it straight? What do you no, mean just like grabbing? pour it by the neck or anything because like a, a wine bottle is kind of feminine and like there's like a real feminine aspect to a glass of wine. And so it's like you wouldn't grab your woman by the neck. So, so like, don't grab a bottle of wine by the neck kind of situation. I understand. But I don't see, know. It's just a me thing. See, but but now that's going to be something that's going to stick with me for ever because of this experience. Because <laughs> I I know when I don't know anything, and I try my best to not even pretend like I know yeah. a small amount because then it, it could potentially look like oh maybe he's hiding his knowledge or, yeah. you know, like, is this guy really just white trash or does he know a little bit? So the only reason you need to know anything about wine is again, so that you can pick out the right wine for the right occasion. That's the only reason. Like, it's not to be pretentious. It's mm-hmm. not to like look cool at the parties. It's not to do anything. It's, it's a, like the purpose of a sommelier, like, you know, like a good producer um, wears all black. So he's not noticed on set and he moves in a way. That he goes unnoticed. Like a good producer, nobody will ever know he even works for your company. Like that's a good producer. A sommelier, I believe, is the same way. Like he shouldn't be the star of the show. You shouldn't know he's the sommelier. Um, he should just be another guy that comes around and he's literally making sure that your dinner or your occasion is the best it could possibly be and that he doesn't fuck it up. He so- doesn't fuck up the chef's food. He doesn't fuck up your party. He doesn't take the limelight away from you know, her 21st birthday or, you know, your uh, college graduation, whatever it is. Like he's just there to pick the right wines to make everybody happy. So it's like the Michelin star evaluator showing yeah. up and you're just, you're not supposed to know that they're at the table, that yeah. they're in your restaurant, that they're grading your food. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think it is. I mean, no, it's fun to be a sommelier and put on your fancy tie and a really nice suit and everything like that. And, and it can be part of the entertainment, but like if you didn't ask for that entertainment, I literally you're going to go like my wife and I are in our 25th anniversary and we're having a filet tonight. And I'll be like, yes, sir. And I will disappear. And you'll say, 
keep it under 75. Great. I'm going to walk back. I'm going to find whatever I can that I think is has a good story or whatever that's going to match you guys' anniversary. Now you want to talk to you. I'm going to come back to the table. I'm going to show you the bottle and say, sir, this is a 2005, blah, 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 blah. It was a wine served at da, 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 from the White House. I just thought it would be really appropriate and really nice for you and your wife on your anniversary. Is this okay with you? And you're going to say, like, that'll be fine. And I'll pour a little glass, let you smell it, taste it really quick, and be like, yeah, this is really good. Thank you. We'll have it. We'll have this bottle. That's great. I'll pour it for you. And then I disappear from your table. Now, you know, change the circumstances here and you have a big party and you want to show off and you've got some wealth and money and be like, Hey, I want like a full assembly. Like I want you fucking like picking everybody's wine out, telling stories, you know, I, well, first of all, if somebody ever told me that this specific wine was served at the white house, I'd be like, I am in the wrong restaurant. <laughs> um, yeah, Chateau, um, and I, and I said that funny, but, uh, uh, um, Sonoma low was Barbara, Bush, I believe it was Barbara Bush's favorite Chardonnay. And so she had it put in the White House. So for a while, this, this Chardonnay, which was called Sonoma Loeb, was like one of the main Chardonnays you could get at the White House, you know, which is kind of cool. But, you know, um, there was a hockey team, the Hurricanes mm-hmm. hockey team, and they maybe won a World Cup or they won something. I don't follow hockey. But their coach at the time, and this was in like 2010 or 2009 or whatever, whatever year they had like a really big year. And for Christmas, the um, – coach and the owner wanted to get the guys a nice bottle of wine to celebrate maybe it was the playoffs i don't know i don't know anything about hockey um and so i and he told me like what he wanted to spend on each bottle and i i had a bottle that i produced for him that i was like well, this is like 35 dollars a bottle and he was like oh you're kind of wanting something fancier than that and i was like oh well the reason why i picked it was because this was the bottle that Lance Armstrong popped on his seventh and final tour to France victory after defeating testicular cancer, lung cancer, and, uh, you know, uh, all those things. And then, you know, coming back after being retired and winning his seventh tour to France victory. And they showered everybody in the champagne. I just think it's really cool. But like, yeah, I guess if like price is the issue, (laughs) then I can get you something more expensive. And he was like, no, that sounds pretty fucking cool. And I was like, (laughs) it's pretty fucking cool. So with that being said, what is the cheapest wine that you can remember that has a good story like that? Well, um, so for me, like wine and money don't go hand in hand. Like just because wine costs a certain amount of money doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cost. I mean, it's a good indicator, mm-hmm. but sometimes you can buy, you know, it's like buying a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. Sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, well, you just buy it because it says Tommy Hilfiger on it. There are some wines out there, but in the wine world, usually the reason why it's that much money I like to use this as an example. I don't play baseball, but I think your kids do. Correct. They, they, they play, play football, football. For a, but they're okay. soccer. They love soccer. They like soccer. Yeah. Shit. I don't know anything about soccer, so I can't use that. But I'll use baseball because I know a little bit about baseball. Okay. If you went to a batting cage and they had an Easton bat, which is like a good, decent metal bat that probably cost you 75, 80 bucks, right? And they said like, hey, you know, you could pay $10 to hit the ball and we have this Easton bat for, you know, $75. You'd be like, dope. Or you can pay $100 and we'll let you use this Hank Aaron bat that was actually used at such and such baseball game by Hank Aaron. Now you would be like, which one could you hit it further with? Probably that metal Easton bat. That only cost you 10 bucks to use for the day. But if you had an opportunity to swing a wooden bat that was held in the hands by Hank Aaron or Babe Ruth or whoever, like you're paying for that. So if that's not important to you, then just use the $10 bat. But right. like, if you're a big Hank Aaron guy, then that's why. So it's like, you know, the, the wines of Burgundy, which are typically the most expensive wines on the planet. The reason why you're paying for this one is because like the size of Burgundy is only a couple of acres. Like, they don't produce a lot of right. grapes. And those grapes are the oldest surviving grapes on the planet Earth, literally planted by the Romans. So it's like, you know, when you're buying a, a Burgundy Pinot Noir and they're under this super strict governing laws, whereas like, you know, in California, if a bad storm or hail comes and you own Nona's Vineyard and you're in, you know, uh, Carolina Beach and, and you have Drew's Vineyard and you're in, you know, further North Wellington and she had a hailstorm come through and her grapes got bruised. Well, the rules around here are cool. She can go and grab 80 percent of your grapes as long as or she can grab 20 or 30 percent of your grapes as long as she meets this. 85% of the grapes in my bottle were from my vineyard, but she can substitute the other 25 or 20% by going over to you. 
She can also like do some blending in some barrels and she can pull from other vintages. Like she might have some older wines from like last year that she could mix together and kind of recreate that taste. Like there's, no, but in Burgundy, no, 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 no. Like the rules are like, this is your vineyard. You have to pull from this plot of land and that's it. And if you have a bad year, well, sucks the suck. That you know, you're just gonna have a low yield of, of wine. Yeah. So that's why vintages come into play. Like it's 2005 a good year. Because you want to know you're still gonna pay 1200 bucks. But if you got it in 2006 and they had like some kind of weird early freeze or early frost and the grapes are a little bit more acidic that year, they don't get to control yeah. very highly governed. So that's why those wines are twelve hundred dollars a bottle. And and people don't buy them because they're trying to be a pretentious snuck up stob. They're yeah. buying it because they're obsessed with that history. You know, it's a bucket list opportunity for them. So I had a twelve hundred dollar bottle of Burgundy, and I hate when people be like, "Well, does it taste anything better than a, a thirty dollar bottle of California wines?" No, I, no, probably not. But like, the wines in California weren't planted by the fucking Romans. Do you do you watch um, any of Matt Character's channels on YouTube? Um, I don't know. Demolition Ranch. And oh, yes. Ranch. Yeah, yeah. So he bought a uh, big compound. It was a resort previously, and it shut down. They went bankrupt like 20, 30 years ago, something along those lines. And as they were going through all the buildings that were still left standing, one of them was a big, uh, almost like a bunker, and it was just a big wine cellar. Yeah. But it hadn't had power run to it for like 20 years. Mm. And they had like 4,000 bottles of wine and champagne That's in so there. so cool. And they were all bad. Yeah, got too hot. <laughs> yeah, they went through there and had them all tested. They yeah. they tried to open some of them themselves to try them, and they were, you know, they were really. Uh, well, they're wine detectives, man. Like yeah. there are people who get paid lots of money to be a wine detective. And when you know, uh, there's a great book series called The Vintage Caper. My wife got me hooked on them years ago, but um, and it's kind of based loosely on a true story. And there's a documentary on Netflix about it, but. These guys will go and they'll shark used bottles, like a used burgundy bottle, and they'll recreate the wine, blending it, like masterfully blend it, and then put it in back into the bottle, resell it, and sell it as if it's real burgundy wine. And um, guys were buying like, you know, these million dollar lots, like, you know, entire pallets of wine from like Barolo or, you know, um, or Brunello's and all these like fancy, really nice wines that are extremely hard to make. And they're all fake. You know, so then they would they hired this uh, detective and the guy had like a blank check. Like all these Californian wine collectors, these millionaires were like, hey, here's a blank check. We need you to get the bottom of this. And he's like, all right. So he goes to like Provence, France, which is like on the Mediterranean, right? It's Provence, Provence it's the Mediterranean, right? It's the southern side. Right? The southern side. Is it on the Mediterranean then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the Mediterranean. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like the home of Rosé. So it's beautiful. It's like the most foodie wine experience like in the world is Provence France and so that's where he stations himself and he's got to get in with all of these like high-end wine parties to try to figure it out you know so now he's got to like go to these galas and he's got to eat these so every day and he used to blog about like what he was eating for the day and you know and you know, he did this for like two years until he was able to bring down this wine but yeah this is, wine is so crazy dude it's like but by the way this wine that you just poured mm -hmm. Um, I don't have to do anything with it. I know that it's, uh, I know that it's Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Just from smelling it, I can tell you it's Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, the color of it's got that like pale straw. It's extremely grapefruity. Um, my nose is terrible because of all the pollen, but I just dribbled it on. <laughs> um, I mean, I haven't even tasted it yet. If I have to guess, like right off the bat, just from smelling it, I'll say New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, let me taste it though, and then I'll tell you my real answer. I was late to look at it because I have no uh, idea. Yeah. So it's, uh, I was just about to, before I even saw this, I was about to say like, this is way more fruity. So it's not New Zealand, but you already showed it to me. It's, it's Sauvignon Blanc and it's from uh, Paso Robles, California. But on the, on the smell, I was going to guess New Zealand, but then when I tasted it, I was just about to say like, no, not New Zealand because it's too fruity, yeah. but it's Sauvignon Blanc. So, um, yeah, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Vina Robles, Paso Robles, California. Dope. Um, I really like it. Really refreshing. Really nice. Mm -hmm. Really fruity. Um, so when you get to like New Zealand, it's going to be way more acidic because it's way less fruity. It'll be more like, uh, eating like a grapefruit, like just taking a bite of a grapefruit. 
put sweat on your forehead. Ooh, that one's a pretty glass. Yeah, I was at frosted. first. Yeah, I was like, that's frosted, not bad, right? And she's like, no, it's just frosted glass. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are we are amateurs here, mm -hmm. just to be clear. Totally fine. Uh, Do you have a I, preference between screw top and cork? Well, uh, white wines, I really like screw tops okay. because it'll last way longer. Um, it's and there's last pass in one bottle. Huh? You're not supposed to drink the whole bottle in one sitting. No, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> if you were to buy it and wait six months or a year or okay. two years, it'll hold up way longer than cork. Gotcha. And it's safer, like, for travel, and you don't always have, like, a cork. You don't have to recork it. You can rescrew it. I'm a huge fan of screw caps, uh, especially in white wine. There are some white wines, like Burgundy Chardonnays and historical wines that I think would be blasphemous to put a screw cap on because the cork is part of the experience. But like for most new world white wines, yeah, like hundred percent. When I say new world, it's like I mean like anywhere that Christopher Columbus discovered is gotcha. considered the new world. Wines that are wine nations that have only been making wines for hundreds of years versus like France, Italy, Germany, Spain, which have been making wines for thousands of years. So there's a huge difference. While we're on the cork subject, I made a comment to her. I don't even think it was on the show. We were just talking about it. They're supposed to stay wet. The cork is supposed to always be. Yeah, wet, so that's right? why you would rack your wine like this. Right. That's that's what I thought. And but I just I don't understand why. Is it just because the cork will, the cork rot will dry faster? and it'll rot? Gotcha. And it when it's wet, it swells. Mm -hmm. When it's not wet, it shrinks and oxygen can get into the bottle. Gotcha. Like in the bottle bath. So that's probably why mm -hmm. Matt Character's stock, besides it, shot. Yeah, and cold, so when you pull a cork, you ever see somebody look at the bottom of a cork? Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I should say the reason why I've you look at the bottom of the cork didn't, didn't know what they were doing, but yes. yeah, people do it all the time. And some people know what they're doing. So most people don't, but I'm like, I've seen people like touch it with their tongue. It's kind of silly. <laughs> I don't know. Like you're not going to get anything from it, <laughs> but like, I guess, but you um, look cool, but you look cool. Maybe. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I can put my tongue on things. So I probably have been guilty of it. <laughs> um, that's pretty gay. But, uh, anyway, you're looking at the bottom of the cork to see if it's wet. Mm -hmm. And if it's not wet, then you can, you know, maybe not serve it um, or at least taste it before you serve it because right. there's a chance that you could have a bad, bad one. Cool thing is those, like sometimes you'll, you'll pull one over and there'll be like tartrates on it, like crystals. And mm -hmm. that's really fucking cool. Like now you know your head. Like if a cork has like crystallized like tartrates on it, it's pretty rad. It's just cool. It's just a, it's a, a, chemi a chemistry cool thing. Like, it's only cool for chemistry nerds, but. So it's probably never in a bottle that we would. Go to the store. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like a twenty dollar bottle of wine, probably a lot of twenty dollar bottles, thirty dollar bottles. Yeah. yeah, twenty and up, you'll start to see tartrates. Especially if you get like a twenty or thirty dollar bottle of like French wine, mm -hmm. you know, you'll really probably see them. But, so, yeah. out of curiosity, then, why don't grocery stores and bottle shops store their wine? On well, the side? grocery store wines are, are fake. Okay. And, sorry, what? Like it's please, grocery. Please explain. Grocery <laughs> store wine is like. It's, it's sad for America, but like we have grocery store wines. They're literally like wineries that make the same wine that is in that bottle is the same wine bottle that is in the bottle in Raleigh is the same as it's in Tucson is the same. It's in, you know, New York city as it is in San Francisco. So they're driving these wine around in tanker trucks, like gasoline tanker trucks full of wine, wow. bottling it at, you know, some facility putting their own label on it. And it's all the same juice. It's all the same shit. When you're talking like, when, when you're talking $16 and under from California, unless it says, you know, I say that, and this is like wine 101, the more that is on the bottle, the most likely you're getting a good deal. So what you want to do is find the bottle that has the most shit on the label for the lowest price. But if it just says California, that means those grapes can go from anywhere in California. If it says Paso Robles, 85% of those grapes, or I don't know what the rule is now, but back then I think it was like 75% of those grapes have to come from Paso Robles. The rest have to come from California. You know, if it says uh, Vino Robles Sauvignon Blanc Jardine Vineyard, Paso Robles 2021, like now you're talking more expensive bottle of wine because now we know what vineyard it came from. Now we know what region it came from. Um, and we know the date that it came from versus if it just said, Vina Robles, Sauvignon Blanc, California white wine, Paso Robles, California, bottled in, blah, blah. Like, you want to know. Sometimes it'll even give you, like, a lot. Yeah, like, wow. a lot. Really like, now you're talking real expensive grapes. Like, if it's, like, 
Lot 13, Julia's Vineyard, 2021, right. blah, blah, blah. I mean, now you're talking like probably a $30 bottle. Because now you can pinpoint where that, where that wine came from. This is going to be our most educational episode ever. <laughs> yeah. So that's really important in wine. So like if you, if you like, let's say you have 16 bucks and you got a hot date. Yeah. And you're like, damn, dude, I'm like 16 bucks. I don't want to woo this. Girl. Right. You know what I mean? Like what you'd want to do is find a bottle that is the most specific bottle you can find for 16 bucks. Now it might only be something as simple as like Vino Robles, Paso Robles, California, blah, blah, blah. It might not say a vineyard name on it for right. 16 bucks, but you might find one that says, you know, and a great way about this, and I did a blog post about it a few years ago, but I went to Food Line, and there was a bottle of wine, and it said such and such vineyard, such and such estate, vintage da-da-da-da-da, lot da-da-da-da-da. And I was like, yo, what? And it said $13. And I was like, we're going to buy everything on the shelf. We never had this wine before in our life. Yeah. We buy everything on the shelf, take it home, we crack it open. I mean, it's like like the <laughs> mecca of $13 bottles of wine. So I do a whole blog and I'm like, so I'm going to do this blog and then I'm going to Google it. I haven't even Googled it yet. But what I'm telling you is I think this is like mispriced. I think they've messed up. Here's why. Like this, yes, this was $13. Then I went and Googled it. And like the standard retail for the store would have been $39, which means they would have charged $70 oh for the bottle. Somebody had missed, like they had just screwed it up oh, and mispriced it. But because I knew that like, all of the information was on the bottle where this wine came from, but I'd already bought like, I don't know, what do we buy? Like 16 bottles or something like that. It's okay. It's like the most of any one wine I've ever bought. And I bought it on a whim, never tried it. And it literally was like one of the, like, it was just a phenomenal bottle. There's, there's probably, great. there's probably somebody else out there just like you. That was like, man, this is a steal. I love it. And then you published that and they probably corrected and they were probably like, yeah, well, we went back and, they, and literally and they had corrected it. And I think I think the store had it on sale for like thirty nine dollars, which was, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, they're probably still getting ripped off. They probably still there's like a loss leader type of. Yeah. But here's the other thing: I bet you more likely that somebody went there and went, "No, I want a nice bottle of wine, not a thirteen dollar. I'm looking for a twenty yeah. twenty five dollar because they're buying it on price, right. not on what's in the bottle. And that's why I say when you know something about wine. It's literally so that the wine store is like a library of books that you can actually read. Right. So I was like, you would never judge a book by the cost, right? You were like, oh, I'm not going to read this book that's only $3 at Popper's bookstore. No, you're going to read it because you like read the back of the book. Blah, blah, blah. Well, it's the same thing. Like I will drink a $6 bottle of wine if it was like Nona's Vineyard in Carolina Beach and Nona Vineyard uh, was the grapes were picked by drew and yada 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 and like i know all this and it's eight Only bucks two murders allowed instead of four <laughs> yeah i'm like hell yeah dude i'm gonna buy that before i would buy like a 30 dollar bottle of wine you know i mean it's just like i said it's just time and a place and being that we're in north carolina people are always like well if there's a time and place for all the wines what do you think about duplin i'm like you ever been in a hot tub with two hot chicks and a bottle of duplin best bottle of wine i've ever had just don't tell my wife <laughs> oh about my it. god <laughs> That's awesome. On that note. Yeah, so that was actually one of the comments that I made to the, the woman at uh, Bridgewater. Is I was like, honestly, I don't ever, I don't walk in the store and say I'm going to buy bottom shelf. Right. I might buy middle. I tend to not go for the high shelf unless it's on sale. and Or I know something specific that she really likes this one. It's a special occasion or we're doing something or we got a windfall of, of money or something like that. Then I might, but typically I'm middle shelf area. And then the next selling point to me is how's the label look? The yeah. label looks cool. Looks nice. Looks. It's important. Yeah. yeah. Because you, you want your label to match. Like you don't want to have like a Halloween label for Christmas dinner. Right. Like right. that would suck. So, I mean, label does come into play. I don't, I wouldn't pick my wine out solely based on the label. Yeah. And what the label says would be, but I'm also not going to buy like, you know, like a, uh, I, I forgot the name of the wine, but it's got this like skeleton woman on it. It's a really nice bottle of wine, but it's like orange and black. And it's got this like Spanish skeleton lady on it. Know exactly you know? Name. Yeah. But I mean, I'm like, I'm not going to buy that on Christmas. Cause like that, that takes away from the mood of the table. You know, right. it doesn't look nice. I mean, so I do get that tables, but the thing with wine is though, is you don't want to buy grocery store wines. Like if it's the same wine that you see in a grocery store, if you recognize it and you've seen it in every gas station and fucking grocery store, it's garbage wine. Like, it, wine should be picked on the on, on literally what it says on the bottle. It's got to be intimate. 
And if you recognize it and you're like, oh, I see this bottle everywhere. It must be good. No, it's like the opposite. Like if you see it everywhere, it's probably not that great because it's, it's the same shit that everybody else is. There's nothing special about it, you know? And so once a winery goes into the grocery store line, it changes forever. Yo is a great example of that. I'm a huge fan of the Wagner Group and Chuck Wagner, not the Wagner Group in Russia, you know, right. but Chuck Wagner and the Wagner family, I should say, in California. I think they're, you know, they, what they've done for the wine industry is incredible. But, you know, like when Miomi went mainstream and was in every single, like it does taste different and it doesn't represent what pin, good Pinot Noir should taste like. I still buy Miomi every once in a while um, because I'm such a fan of the family and stuff. But like it's once they sold out, it's not, it's not the same anymore. It's, it's you know, it's mass produced. Like everything else, so you're saying so. the standards are just lower by right, going into it's just mass market. produced. Like, how can you, you know, if you're pulling grapes from one vineyard that's farmed by you two, like that's going to have a lot more care and, and be a lot more specific than a, a vineyard that's so mass and vast that spans counties and you're using all sorts of pesticides, you're using all sorts of shit to keep those grapes. You're, you're running tractors all through the damn thing. Like nobody gives a shit about the soil. You know, whereas if you go to like Caduceus, which is like Maynard, Maynard Keenan, the guy from Tool, you know, his winery, I mean like that dude's got like soil specialists on staff. Like these guys are monitoring everything. And it's just so that the, it's farming. And when you meet real farmers, wine farmers, they're rad, dude. They're like gnarly hands and like, you know, they're wearing overalls, they're sweaty, they're stinky, you know, and they're, they've got this beautiful glass of wine that they've created. They've farmed it. They've uh, shaped the vine so that the grapes grow in the perfect cluster. They've tested the acidity and they, you know, they use biodynamic farming practices or sustainable farming practices. So, you know, they're out in there shooting shotguns to keep the uh, birds from eating their grapes, wow. you know, like they're planting flowers so that insects will eat the flowers and not the grapes. I mean, there's so much work that goes into it. And there's so much passion. What do you think is going to be better? Sorry. That or this mass produced conglomerate of shit that you're putting in your body that probably has metals in. I mean, like they've recalled wine from like arsenic. Um, it's big recall. It's naturally occurring grapes like it is an apple. Right, I know but you, got, you can't have like you can't have like but a certain amount. Right. And they recalled a whole bunch of California grapes a couple of years ago because it, um, like, it was all the Trader Joe wines actually. <laughs> um, my, my dad actually built a. Uh, uh, the actual like facility that was attached to the vineyard in Michigan. And they had some other like organic label that came with it and things like that. So they had to, in order to enter the property with even the construction vehicles, bringing in materials, things like that, they had a point off site far enough away from where anything could, you know, contaminate the soil where they had to literally clean the entire vehicle before it was allowed to enter the property. Yeah. They had to wear things over their shoes, like like mud boots, essentially, and they would bring them out to you. You couldn't bring your own in. There was all kinds of stuff that went into it. I've actually never even been there because that happened shortly after I moved to North Carolina, and I've only been up there a couple times since then. Maybe we'll have to. It's right on the right on the coast of Lake Michigan. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you the name of yeah. my head, but my dad knows it. But you know, it's it's all that fun. Like when you start entertaining yeah. with wine. And you kind of learn, you don't have to know a lot about wine, right? But once you know a little bit about wine, if you're like a shy introvert person, mm -hmm. you and you have people over to your house, you can literally entertain them with just with the wine because nobody's used to it. Nobody's in it. I used to teach a class called Entertaining with Wine that I invented. Mm -hmm. The whole class, I invented all the food to go with it um, because I was hosting so many wine parties that it gets expensive. Right. Um, it gets obnoxious. So I invented my own wine party and, and I did it for Jesse Weisman one time nice. from the drinking bros. But, um, essentially like I did like all the food for 20 bucks and all the wine for like 60 bucks. And so like my theory was that like, you can go buy a whole bunch of nice cheeses and that's $60, right? Like if you get a platter of a bunch of different cheeses, that's minimum of 30, you know, yeah. probably upwards of 60. Then you get your charcuterie, your meats, there's another 15 bucks. So you're like $70 or $55 in on just the charcuterie board. Right. Then you've got to go and buy the wine. And now you're, you're into a hundred bucks. So what I invented was like mussels, right? Mussels cost $3 and 99 cents a bag. One bag will feed six people. We start our main meal. Uh, when you come to my house, you have sparkling wine, a, a $9 sparkling Prosecco, slightly sweet 
really pretty party bottle. One's called like Lamarck's or Lamax, like, uh, which, you know, kind of looks like your name. Um, uh, but it's a blue Prosecco. It's like 9.99. It's super unoffensive, but nobody gives a fuck. Um, what is bubbles, right? Like nobody is looking for expensive bubbles these days. Anyway, so you buy this $10 bottle of sparkling wine and you have this $3.99 cent bag of mussels and they come into your house and you're like, Hey, mussels are ready. Now, what's the cool thing about mussels is you steam them in three minutes and then you use the mussels to be your utensils. So you don't have to bring out any utensils. Like you put the pot on the table and you give them like a little plate and they use the mussel to pick up another mussel and that is your utensil. And so they think this is the coolest thing in the world. I'm eating with a mussel. I'm eating the mussels. I have this great bottle of sparkling wine. And here's what else is happening. Because it's a mussel and it's, it's not like cheese, right? Like how much cheese and bread can you eat? And then you're full. So the problem is your wife makes this amazing meal, right? Like maybe, maybe she's making a big lasagna and she made her own pasta noodles or whatever. And, she, you know, or pick a dish. And she puts all this work and effort into it. But then you show up to the house and you've got this bottle of, uh, you know, $13 white wine or $14 white wine. And then you've got this charcuterie board that's $75 of charcuterie. And they're going to have like four or five pieces of cheese, four or five pieces of bread. And then they're not hungry anymore. But when people aren't hungry, they're not entertained anymore. No, just- they don't care. Now you have to do all the fucking talk and all the shit because they're not peckish anymore. So you, you pull out this half bag, this, this bag of mussels, and you got six folks. You're only going to get like three or four mussels out of that. But, you know, like you're eating it slow. You're talking. you got the sparkling wine. Nobody's yeah. slamming yeah. bubbles. Yeah. Oh, and then I forgot my favorite part. Bubbles, right? Like automatically tells you work's over. We're at our friend's house. Yeah. Party, Party has started. Like, there's just something, like, when people are like, Psh, which is like what you're supposed to do, you're like, yeah, okay, I get it. Maybe in a restaurant because you don't want to move the restaurant. But, like, if it's at your house, I want to hear the, because then I'm like, oh, my shoes are off, my hat's coming off, Ranger panties are on, <laughs> let's roll. You know what I mean? So, you got that going on, and they're kind of like peckish. And then you bring out this lasagna, and now you bring out your $20 bottle of wine, right, with the lasagna. And the, the, the wine goes right with the lasagna. You went to the wine store and you said, I'm having lasagna. What's the perfect bottle of wine? I want to stay under 25 bucks. She gives you a nice $20 bottle of Chianti or, you know, whatever. A good Italian based red wine. And you got that and you got your thing. And now the wine complements the, uh, uh, the lasagna. Because if you, you know, if you buy another $13 bottle of red wine, right? Because you spent $75 on cheese and so now you're going cheap as fuck on your wine. And you buy this like cheap ass grocery store Cabernet Sauvignon. It was very juicy and jammy. Well, she just put all this effort into this fucking lasagna and all you're going to taste is blackberry and strawberries and your teeth are going to be red, not from lasagna, but from wine. So why did she spend all that time making her own homemade noodles and her grandmother's famous Italian sauce? I am guessing is Nona Italian? Nona is Italian. Yeah. Okay, that's why I'm going with Italian. <laughs> it's a different right spelling. But you, know, you got all of this stuff going on and like nobody cares anymore. And you got a shittier bottle of wine that nobody cares about. Right. So like the wine's average. And now it's making a great meal kind of average. And you've had an average cheese bread. And I don't care, like, you know, you got Humboldt Fog and you've got, you know, Gouda and Camembert and all these, like, great cheeses. It's still fucking average because nobody gives a shit. Right. Yep. Nobody appreciates that shit anyway. I mean, sometimes you do. Like, if it's girls' night and you're going to just eat cheese all night, that's when you go right. with the cheese. But when you have, like, six fucking people over, that's not the time. You know what I mean? So you get these mussels that cost you three dollars and ninety nine cents, and then you bought a nice cheap ass bottle of sparkling wine. Now you save yourself thirty bucks. Buy a thirty dollar bottle of wine to go with dinner. That's not going to overpower the dinner. And then guess what? We still got a little bit of money left over. You have your dessert, and then you got a dessert wine. Now here's the cool thing about all of this, right? When you have a sparkling wine and you have mussels, what are the people going to ask you? Oh, I've never had mussels before. That's great. Oh, so how do you do it? You know, you just take the little clamper and you clamp on. Oh, that's so cool. I've never even done that before. Oh, and sparkling wine? That's so nice. Thank you so much. Oh, this is so great. Thank you, guys. Thank- oh, my gosh. The lasagna? You made the noodles yourself? <laughs> These are amazing. What is this wine? This is fabulous. This is so great. Oh, my God. And you made the noodles yourself because they're still hungry. See, if they ate all that cheese and that bread, they wouldn't give a fuck about your lasagna. They would be like, oh, the lasagna's great. The wine's great. But now, like, they're hungry. They're worked up. They're like, this is so nice. And then you come out with your creme brulee. It costs you fucking beans to make, right? Because it's, what is it? Eggs, uh, egg, egg cream. cream, and, cream and so super cheap, right? right? And very, you know, it's not very difficult to make. Put it in the refrigerator and you got the little torch. Now you've got the torch. Your buddy's like, dude, what are you doing over there? And you're like, oh, I'm torching the, I'm torching this. You're torching the dessert. What are, what are we having for dessert? You know, and it's, you got the fire and everything, and you bring out this little sweet bottle of Riesling that you've made to pair perfectly with these cream brulee. And they're like, oh my god, you guys are, oh, you 
guys went so out of your way. And literally, it's cheaper than if you would have done the cheese platter and the mediocre wine and, you know, the lasagna dinner. So this, this is like the polar opposite to everything that we and I especially have ever gone. Wait, when I smoked the pork and would have, you know, 20, 30 hours of pork. pork. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty inexpensive. And then I tell people, bring your own beer. I've, yeah. I've got the meat. Bring your own beer. Yeah. So we're on this spectrum. And now we're learning about this spectrum. Well, I mean, that's fun too, right? Like, I mean, yeah. there's something around sitting around a, yeah. a, 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 a barbecue pit drinking beer. Like, I love that. Yeah. You know, I'm down uh, tailgating. This isn't for everything. But I'm just saying, like, you have that nice wine night. The new neighbors came in. You don't want to fucking buy, like, $30 steaks and then, like, a $70 cheese bread. And then you got, you know, three bottles of $10 wine. That's another 30 bucks. Uh, and then at the end of the day, are they wild? And then you've had to talk to them about sports and all this other shit. When you break out muscles, I promise you, they're going to talk to you about those muscles for like 10 fucking minutes. They're like, this is so cool. And you're like, yeah, I got them at Aldi. And they're like, Aldi, and you're like $3 back. $3 back. Which Aldi do you go to? I might go to the one. I've never even been to Aldi. You know what I mean? It's like the whole conversation becomes around right. this, and you don't have to physically entertain them. You're not trying to make shit up. And it makes these dinners, uh, uh, you know, less awkward. And I call it entertaining with wine. Um, and sometimes I go as simple as they show up to your house. You have the bottle of sparkling wine. You buy a, you buy two one dollar and ninety nine cent bars of chocolate. One seventy five percent dark chocolate, and the other one eighty five percent dark chocolate. You take a plate, you crumble up the seventy five percent, crumble it up, smash it up, let it drop on the plate like in little shards, like a broken glass of chocolate on a plate. You do the same with the other one. Full card, 75%, 85%. Right. Or just fold the wrapper of the you know organic chocolate that you bought and put it on the dish. You got bottle of sparkling wine. And they come in, and that's what you have to pick off of. Chocolate and sparkling wine go hand in hand together. And sparkling never has to be expensive. Buy a $10. And now they're like, what is this? And you're like, well, this is 75% cocoa. This is 85% cocoa. They're both from, uh, you know, uh, Honduras. They're Honduran chocolate. And um, it's like fair trade organic. They were like $3.99 a bar. I put them both out of here just to see what the difference is. This one's Honduras and this one's Ecuador, you know, or whatever. And now they're like, oh, that's interesting. I've never even thought about that. And they they try each one. They're like, oh, this one's tried. This one's actually sweeter. And it's 85%. They're like, what's the, and you're like, oh, I don't know. And like all of a sudden, like everything is about this weird three, $4 bar of chocolate that you bought mm -hmm. and this nine dollar bowl of sparkling wine that you bought and now you can spend all your money on the fancy ass lasagna or the spaghetti or whatever the fuck you're gonna make for the night and that's where you put all your effort and then you get this nice 30 dollar bottle of wine and you really haven't spent any more than you know what you would do so like i think entertaining with wine is a lot of fun and I, that was one of my favorite courses to to teach that i invented was <laughs> you're you teaching went, me you went to one of those painting things one time didn't you me no yeah. What did you do with the girls or was there? That was a birthday party. Uh, that was a birthday party and it was a them party and I was just the driver. Did we do this already? No, we did not. Where was I at? Did I even go for you? Um, I don't know. I was <laughs> talking. <so. laughs> um, I've been, I've been waiting cause I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to jump ahead. You know, I wanted, you, you're kind of walking us through this and I'm, I'm worried that she like, no man, that one was supposed to sit for a minute. As I just put that like super spicy meat in my mouth. I love the smell of this one. Really? I can't smell anything. It's definitely um less overpowering than the other It's one. vegan. It's vegan? It's I'm says. sorry. Yeah. Isn't I mean, all is wine vegan? All wine should is be vegan. vegan. <laughs> there's there's some things when yeah, I, when I see the labels, I'm like, why is You're that? obviously the, just the, pandering no, 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 at that the, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, the the dog shampoo. It says it's not animal tested. How the fuck do you test dog shampoo without testing it on dogs? That's a great point. <laughs> I mean, this is for way. our allergy prone dog yeah. that we need to know that it works. Yeah. So like super subtle nose, which again makes me say not New Zealand on this one on the nose. Uh, but the grapefruit is still there. Mm -hmm. And this is more like that ruby red grapefruit. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. like, a little sweeter. A little sweeter grapefruit. I do like this. I like this already. I like it too. And it's sweeter on the palate for sure. Um still like a really good high acidity that's that kind of burn that you get going on there mm -hmm. it's actually really nice like it's really nice bottle of wine um wow mm. um yeah. i mean i'll just go california sauvignon blanc again possibly sauvignon uh, blanc, yeah but not kind of, it's not new zealand though no give me one second let me, let me play with it here so it's clear 
any color to okay, it. Okay, I guess we should ask, how many variations of Sauvignon Blanc, like how many locations in the world are really known for that wine? Um, you can have like a Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, Californian Sauvignon Blanc. I think now like even like Washington's starting to make some Sauvignon Blancs. I've heard that like maybe Texas was flirting around with it, which I, I've never had that. I, I would think that Texas would be too hot for it. Um, New Zealand's like probably the most popular, but that is like cat piss smells like <laughs> cat urine. I don't know. The seven ninety nine New Zealand Sauvignon yeah, Blanc. Always smells like cat urine. We still is, drink it. I drink it, but it smells like cat urine. I, oh, what did I say when you smell that? Cassis. Cassis. Cassis is what you'll hear Fuck like, here. wine people say. Uh, but that just translates to I like cat. it. I still drink it, but it <laughs> yeah. smells just like cat urine. That's, if you think about it too hard. That's that's the uh same thing we were talking about the difference between people local here calling cockroaches water bugs. Oh uh, a cockroach. <laughs> yeah, this is like super interesting. Um, to be clear, I was not trying to trick him. I don't know anything about wine. I couldn't trick him if I tried. I, I mean, like the only time it's like such a subtle Sauvignon Blanc taste, and it's typically blended, is in France. So, like, maybe this is like a weird French um, non-blended Sauvignon Blanc, just Sauvignon Blanc on their own. So, I, my guess on this is French French Sauvignon Blanc. Should wear it. I was Chilean. I said that. Well, I didn't say it, but uh, Chilean is a, is a really great place. Um, the funny thing about Chile is a lot of the winemakers in Chile are French because during the uh, flux around pandemic, or the, the little nematode that wiped out all the France vineyards, they all fled to Chile and Argentina and started making wines there. So that's why like Carmenere tastes so much like Merlot and it's almost like impossible to tell the difference. Because it's the French started growing, Interesting. like the, as close to them or close as they can get. How much? This is really good though, um, and because it's Chile, it's probably super cheap. Yeah, it was. super cheap, <laughs> um, like inexpensive. Yeah, but yeah. honestly, this is like maybe one of the top. Super tasty. Top mm -hmm. Sauvignon blocks I've had. Thank you, um, woman from Bridgewater really great. for recommending um, that one. That is really good. I yeah, I just guessed France because. It's so subtle, and France is so subtle with their Sauvignon Blanc, and um, but Chile is super rad place to. to be yeah, like, I, I don't drink a lot of Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, so. So even when we were talking about doing the tasting, there's like not. That, I just don't drink. It's hard to find. I didn't even. I didn't even know that you were going to be able to identify locations. So that wasn't even a consideration for me. I thought you were more saying that you were going to try and guess what kind of wine, but I thought that was obvious. So I. I I didn't even know what well, when, when you're tasting, tasting would be. When you were testing yeah. for wine, they'll pour you three red wines and they'll pour you three white wines and they're just in a glass. Yeah. And you gotta go through all of them. And you gotta get 70% each glass. So 70% like identifying accuracy. location. Right, like like date. location, date. Yeah, 70% of those. And so it's like if it's not seven year old blog, but it was nineteen ninety-eight, well then I got nineteen ninety-eight right, but I got Great right or wrong. There's also like in the a region. scale of like acidity and like calling out the right color. Yeah, there's the a right. lot. Is there ever or has there ever been an instance where something was misrepresented or mislabeled? Like it maybe they call it Sauvignon Blanc, but it's actually closer to something else. From the so I did a wine tasting in front of a bunch of people one time. And when I do a real wine tasting, I have like my paper, mm -hmm. I have all my notes, like like my indicators that I played with in my brain, right. like I have my stone fruits, all my fruits, and I look at this paper and I kind of like mark it off in my, like what I taste and what I don't. And then I add them all together. And then that's what I come up with. Like I'll say like, okay, it's high acidity. So I was in this wine thing and I was, it, it was a really important one. And there's a lot of people, I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it was a big deal. So for me, it was especially a big deal. My wife was there. And um, so I'm doing the wine thing and they were like, okay, and the red wines, I got 100%. Like, day, time, place, everything. Like, nice. Perfect. They were easy. Three white. And then they had one white wine, two white wines. I can't remember. But um, anyway, one of the white wines, I like tasted it and was like, oh, shit. I have no idea what this is. So like, I get my paper. And I mean, it takes me like, and it's awkward because it takes me like, five minutes like three or which four which is minutes. a lifetime when they're lifetime. staring at you <laughs> and i'm like trying to go through it really fast and what it equaled was a wine i've never even tasted before or had before and so i was like i'm gonna take a guess 
I've never even had this kind of wine before, yeah. but I'm guessing that this is what this wine is because I've never had it before, but I've studied enough theory about this wine that I just, yeah. I'm going to guess it. And I was like, I think it is a Pinot Grigio, but it's not Pinot Grigio because it's an Italian grape and it's only found in two parts of Italy. And none of the characteristics of this, one being oak, is allowed in Italy. So it cannot be an Italian Pinot Grigio. So it's got to be some kind of like weird, like flirty Pinot Grigio, which would be like something in California would fuck around with that. And because it's definitely like a mixture of like French and American oak, because there's like these like weird like caramel notes and, um, and a little bit of like this charriness and everything. So I was like, it's a blend of oak. Nobody else is going to blend oak except Californians because they're the only ones that have money to do shit like that. And, and it was super fruity and there was like barely any acidity. So I was like, it's got to be like middle of California, like hot as fuck California. And I was like, so I think it's just like, and it's young. It's a very young wine. It's like has no age on it. And uh, so I was like, I'm going to say this is like a 2020 or 2018 because it was 2020. So I would say 2018. Like I think it's like a 2018 Pinot Gris from like Paso Robles, California. Because they're the only ones doing funky shit like that. And I bet because it's there and they're like really proud of themselves, I bet you this is like a $22 bottle of wine. And it should not be. Like you could get a Pinot Grigio in Italy for like eight bucks. Same way. But I mean, this is cool. I could be completely wrong. I have no idea. I've never had a Pinot Gris from California with this much oak or faster bubbles. Like I'm just, it's that's new to me, but that's my guess. And they were like, Oh my God! It's a 2018 Paso Robles 21.99. Da, 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 da. I was like, I got 100. percent My wife was like, ah! I was like I'm sucking your dick later. That's awesome. I That's crushed crazy. it. I never had that wine before, That's, and that was cool. But That's nuts. That's I could probably get close that was a little to that with luck. some whiskey. Yeah, I was going to say definitely whiskey or bourbon, bourbon for you, yeah. but not that's, wine. Yeah, but see, like, you know, that's, you know, I like, I drink a lot of whiskey and out of the distillery yeah. and everything, but, you know, you're, like, you're flirting with one region. Yeah. Kentucky or Tennessee or, like, America. Yeah. You know, with wine, one, there's white and there's red. There's sweet. There's fortified. There's sparkling. There's still. Right. And you're talking about, like, Lebanon, Syria. Australia, Argentina, North and South. You're talking about France, Italy, Spain. I mean, this is like the list goes on. And that's why I say, like, when you think you know something about wine, you take a look back and you're like, God, I don't know shit about wine. Like, how, um, how, if you had to just eliminate everything and you could only have one variety or varietal, I don't know uh, if is variety the wrong word entirely. No, that's right, okay. Yeah. Um, one grape varietal? One region, uh-huh. one. Great varietal, oh, wine varietal. Be a dick. Yeah, yeah what, <laughs> that's a mean place. What, what would that? Which one? Last, would you marry? The last man no. standing. Be? I mean, I. I couldn't. I mean, that would be so hard. That would be like saying, like, well, who's your favorite child? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how do you pick? Like, you know which one you like right now, but like, uh yeah. What about you, honey? I, I like I like Bordeaux. Okay, but so, like, like, so you're going to just give up Br- Br- Brunello's forever? Like, that to. would be depressing. <laughs> Is there a place near you guys if we came up there sometime or <laughs> even near here or somewhere in between that we could meet up with you guys and actually do this kind of experience? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could. I mean, like, there's Duplin, mm-hmm. there's Hennett. It's not, it's not the she same. Might as not like, be able to get oh, it's um, you yeah. know, um, Yakin Valley, which is like, Probably like three or four hours from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about three hours probably from here. Because you've never even heard of us. Right it's like there. between here and Boone. She also didn't know anything about Jordan's dad being uh-huh. made. Elkin, North Carolina. Never been there. Uh, Winston Salem. Uh, uh, Pilot Mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the Andy Griffith Show, Avery County. That's where they filmed the Andy Griffith Show. I never saw it. You know the Andy Griffith Show? I grew up without TV. Yeah, she didn't have electronics. But there. you know there's the Andy family. Griffiths show, right? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. up there, there's some really great vineyards. Um, uh, Jolo Vineyards, one of my favorites. Um, he's growing some cool San Giovese. Okay, but going back to like Mariana, Mariana Grape Varietal. I mean, my wife lived in France for a while. and She taught French at NC State. We drink a lot of French wines. Um, so, I mean, I like... To have a happy life and a happy wife, I would say France, because she's gonna have to drink this wine with me. Mm-hmm. Well, like if I was divorced, um, 
and I'd be sleeping around anyway, so I wouldn't just pick one grape varietal. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I would pick Brunello's. From, there wouldn't be Bones Farm? No, Brunello <laughs> di Montalcino from Italy. It's probably like my passion wine. I just really, really always enjoy those in every out, out circumstance. But it, it would suck, man, because then like, would, so I can never drink sparkling wine again. I can never drink sweet wine. Like, what, like if you're having spicy food, you have to have sweet wine. Like, if you're having Thai food, you got to have a Riesling. I can't imagine having Thai food without a Riesling or, you know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine having steak without a, you know, a, Interesting. a big cab or Syrah, you know, like. Yeah. Uh, it would just suck to have to pick one. I would pick bourbon. So, you're sommelier. You own a distillery. Everyone else is doing the seltzer thing. What would it take for us to... I made a seltzer like two years in a row. It's really? really good. What would it take for us to make a wine? Man, the um, beverage industry is just the, the, beer, the bureaucracy of mm -hmm. it. I mean, we're taxed 38%. Wow. It's depressing. Like when you see how much money you made and then how much money you have to give the government. Yeah. You're talking federal government, state government, county level. And I pay a sin tax. S-I-N. Because I don't contribute to society. So I have to pay a sin oh tax. Oh, my God. That's, I that's a real thing? It's a real thing. It's the, depressing. The, the distillery or the product? The distillery. Okay. Um, so and I mean, like, you don't contribute to society. Right. Like so, having an establishment so the syntax in a goes small to like, town. The syntax goes to like famous that have been infected by DUIs and people who knew AA and people that are on the like court order. Oh. Like it's a tax to pay for all that shit. Um, and that's just a North Carolina thing. But you can go to church enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, honestly, like being making beverage is a whole other animal. Um, and there's just, everybody wants in on it. Right. Yeah. So like you got to pay the website people, you got to pay the marketing people, you got to pay the font people, you got to pay um, your attorneys, right. you know, cause like you're going to get sued or people are going to have something to say. Um, all the taxes. I mean, at the end of the day, like unless you're selling an absolute shitload of that alcohol, it's hard to make money in the United States yep. with with one, with making beverage. So, what do you do if you had a winery or a brewery? Are you paying the same? Well, they taxes? say they say like the quickest way to turn two million dollars into one million dollars is to open up a winery. <laughs> it sounds like the uh, uh, boat people break out another thousand. Because everything, it's always broken. There's yeah, I mean, wineries there. are not generally big money makers. I mean, think about it. You have to have tractors. Those tractors are like $300,000 each. Jeez. You've got to have laborers, tons of them. you got to have baskets, totes. you got to have hoses. These hoses are super expensive. you got to have transportation to transport the wine around. The oat barrels are super expensive. Um, you pretty much have to have somebody working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because... You're checking fermentation levels. I mean, unless you have the money to automate it, now you're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, automating your system. And then you have these cooling stainless steel vessels that are hundreds of thousands of dollars each. And you're probably going to have 15 to 20 of those in a bigger winery. Then you got to have a tasting room and lounge. And then you got to have boxes. And, you know, think about the cases. I mean, those, those boxes are $2 each. Right. Well, if you, you know, if you're shipping out thousands of boxes, you know, you're, you got to buy probably twelve, thirteen thousand dollars worth of just cardboard. Then you got to buy all the glass. That's another twenty thousand dollars for glass. And then you got to buy your corks and these and this little wrapper right here. This little wrapper right here is like three dollars. This little guy right here is like two dollars. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, now when you buy them in bulk, they're like cents, but you know what I mean? Then you got a back label, you got a front label. Um, you got to get your uh, numbers stamped into this. Mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, it's just so much. Everybody wants a piece of that. I, so it's I'll stay, I'll stay my lane. I'll stay my yeah, lane. I'm done. Like, I, <laughs> dude, I'll never get back in the beverage industry. Like making beverage. You're, but you're still the distiller is still open, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you don't never, bottle rum anymore. Yeah, I do. I'm saying I'll never do it again. Like I'll never you start it. Start. Oh, okay, like if okay. somebody's like, dude, let's start a brandy business. Or let's gotcha, start a wine okay, business. Okay. I'll okay. be like, no, I'm good, dude. Like, I don't want to ever do like. If I could sell it a distillery tomorrow, I would. So, you know? A good idea. Is okay, so that's a lot of work. It's up for sale if anybody wants it. <laughs> Always. The right dollar amount, the right blank check. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, maybe the book makes the, you know, makes me yeah. a little bit of money to 
to do it, but it's a lot. Okay. I mean, there's a really great movie called Bottle Shock. Kind of like now that I own my own place and I have for five years, when I watch the movie Bottle Shock, I'm like, oh shit, like that movie's way more true than it's fake. And it's a great movie. It's got the guy from Star Trek. Um, what's his name, honey? And this this is specifically about the beverage making industry. I know it's about um, uh, uh, Chateau Montalena, which was this uh, vineyard in California in the sixties and seventies, and they were making wine, and nobody in America drank wine. Period. And wine wasn't cool; wasn't a thing. Nobody was drinking it, and um, they wanted to enter this contest called the Showdown in Paris. And it's the biggest world ranking, uh, biggest snobbery. But if you win, uh, your wine gets picked up by like every restaurant of right. caliber in the world. Right. And Chateau Montalena, America had never entered uh, the, the showdown. We didn't Paris. talk about it yet. Uh, again. Well, his glass was empty. And, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. And um, and so anyway, he entered. This he entered it in the, into Paris, and it was like a big deal. And overnight, American wines became the next big thing. Mm-hmm. It was in 1978, and without Ch- Chateau Montalena, it would have never happened. But the whole movie is about him trying to open a vineyard. Everything is crazy, and you know, like I said, hail and bad storms and bad vintages, and running out of money, and the bank's not giving any more money. Needs new tractors, and like. Anything that can go wrong is going wrong, and then they have to fight through it. But it's a great movie with a bunch of cool actors in it that you would know. Um, it's a very fun movie. There's like some boxing in there. It's like super funny. Great night. It's a, one of my favorite movies, like honestly. God. And it's called Bottle Shock. And it's got Paul, uh, not Paul Giovanni. It's got, uh, babe, can you look up uh, Bottle Shock and the actors in there? You'll know who they are. But, um, you'll be like, holy shit, I know that guy. Oh, I know that guy too. So, um, uh, never even. Heard of it? Of all the of all the movies that I pirated, Never heard of <laughs> really fun movie, a really fun movie. When does it come out? Chris Pine. Oh, I know Chris. Okay, yeah. So, okay. Um. Yeah. Like, remember the bad sheriff in Robin Hood, with Kevin Costner? That's been so long. Like, I'll cut his heart off with a spoon because it'll hurt my uh, twit. Oh, you don't remember that guy? That was like 99 or some ridiculous Robin amount Hood? of years yeah, ago. Yeah. I'm 40. So I only saw it one time, so I don't that. remember what happened in 99. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really fun movie. Um, you should definitely watch it. But yeah, it's called Bottle Shock, and now that I watch that movie, I'm like, holy shit. Like, oh, that is so real. <laughs> I'll try it out. She won't watch any movies with me anymore. She, she'll only watch TV shows because she likes having that segmented. Mm-hmm. She will yeah, Last so night. I can run away after 30 yeah. minutes yeah, because she, I'm ready to go to bed. She won't watch a full movie because she doesn't want to start the movie. I bet you would watch this one because it's like, right, babe? Like, it's a, it's not a chick flick, but it's not like a masculine movie. Okay. Yeah. It's I'll give it a try. And especially if you have a bottle of Chardonnay, like a really nice bottle of Chardonnay to watch while you watch the movie. It just makes that movie so much better. I've never been a Chardonnay fan. But I will try but, it after that just movie. for you. But you will after that movie. There might be, we might just be going to the wrong places or buying the wrong bottles. Getting the wrong Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want to go down the Chardonnay rabbit hole, that is probably the dumbest thing anybody can ever say is they don't like Chardonnay because Chardonnay can be still, it can be sweet, it can be oaky, it can be acidic, it can be not oaky, it can be all the things that white wine is. We've been buying the wrong Chardonnay. So you can get. I don't think I've ever actually bought Chardonnay. You can get an unoaked Chardonnay, which tastes like Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Or you can get an oak bomb Chardonnay that tastes like Cabernet Sauvignon. It's very bourbony. It has these like crazy like bourbon characteristics and a big oak bomb Chardonnay or oaky, very woody Chardonnay. Or you can go like super acidic with an unoaked Chardonnay. Almost all champagne is made with Chardonnay. So if you like champagne and sparkling wine, it's almost all made with Chardonnay. Interesting. But it's very acidic Chardonnay. So Chardonnay is probably the most widely grain, grow, grown grape in the world. And it's the most consumed grape in the world. And it's because it can be everything. It can be sweet. It can be dry. It can be acidic. It can be fruity. It can be all the things. So when somebody's like, do you like white wine? You're like, yeah, I like white wine. And they'd be like, oh, cool. Well, I have this great Chardonnay. Like, I don't like Chardonnay. And you're like, 
<clears throat> you can't say that. You can say I don't like some Chardonnays, but you can't say you like white wine and you don't like Chardonnay because Chardonnay can literally encapsulate almost any white wine that exists, okay. like any of them, which is always fun. But it was a really cool thing to say in America. I don't like Chardonnay. And the movie um, um, Sideways, which is another great wine movie with Paul Giovanni, was even a better book. But in the movie, they didn't do a great job of encapsulating the book, but in the movie, uh, Paul Giovanni is like, I don't want any more fucking Merlot. And overnight, it's called the sideways effect. The sale of Merlot dropped, and the height of um, Pinot Noir like, took off, and everybody started drinking Pinot Noir, and nobody drank Merlot, even though Merlot is a much superior grape. And Merlot, which is easier to grow and cheaper, became, I mean, uh, and more expensive, became very low price for high quality Merlot and very Pinot Noir being one of the harder grapes to grow went up in price and the quality lowered because of this movie. And 11 or 12 years later, UC Davis ended up doing this study called the sideways effect because even 12 years after the movie, those numbers were still the same. Nobody would drink Merlot, even though Merlot and Cab are like brother and sister. Wow. Like super related, but like nobody would drink Merlot anymore. And it all stemmed because some bitch or dude fucking watched that movie and was like, yeah, I'm not drinking more fucking Merlot. And it just spawned through the whole country. Wow. And everybody in this state will be like, yeah, I don't like Merlot. Another dumb thing to say. If you drink Cabernet Sauvignon, you by proxy have to like Merlot because they're so similar that even a sommelier like me will sometimes get Merlot and uh, Cabernet confused, especially if the cab doesn't have a lot of tannins and the Merlot happens to have a lot of tannins. You're like the Merlot is cab and this cab is Merlot because of the tannin difference. I mean, it, there's such fine details in the difference between Cabernet and Merlot that for somebody to say, I like Cabernet, don't like Merlot is just foolish. It's like, they're just saying things to say it. It would be like, interesting. I don't know. I'm about I to make your head explode. Huh? I'm about to make your head explode. Okay. I hate red wine in general. That's okay. Like, I mean, there are people who just don't like, and then, you know, so the difference between red wine and white wine is white wine's fruit characteristics are citrus-based fruits. So, like, when you're drinking a white wine, you want to think of, does it taste like lemon? No. Does it taste like grapefruit? In this case, yes. That's the characteristic I get. Red wine would be like, do I like blackberries? No. I mean, I'm like, do I sm do I taste blackberries? No. Do I taste strawberries? Yes. So, like, white wine is going to be orange, lemon, lime, lime zest, stone fruit, passion fruit, um, you know, any of these, like, acidic based fruits. Whereas red wine's always going to be like strawberry, blackberry. Is it jammy? Is it not jammy? Oh, and then also with, with red wine, you have like earth, soil, dirt, like, like, like if you're drinking wine, red wine from Spain, I mean, you're basically drinking like dust and soil. Like it's very earthy and like has no flavor at all. And then there's like Rhone's, uh, they're like Rhone wines, like in Southern France, where it tastes like a barnyard, where it's like if you think of chicken shit and horse hair okay, and so sweaty this, horses, you're this, like, this is why I don't yeah. like it. But then California wine, you smell it and you're like blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, blueberries and blackberries. And then you grab this like Southern Rhone red wine and you're like, I don't know what that is. And then I say, have you ever been to a farm, like a horse barn? <laughs> oh, fuck. This smells like a horse barn. You know what I mean? And like you start to understand, like it's just. You know, you got to be thinking about things like olives, right? Like that's why the olives and wine go together because a lot of, there are some like Hungarian white wines that really have this kind of like olive taste. Like there's a, um, a Chilean white wine that smells like green bell peppers. Like, I mean, it, like if you smelled this wine and you weren't able to touch it, you were just like, they were like, smell this. What is it? You'd be like green bell pepper. Like, no, it's actually a fucking white wine. Wow. So yeah, I mean, there's like all these different, but yeah, I mean, it's fine not to like red wine. If you're not into like blackberry and blueberry and all that stuff, and you're more into like citrusy fruits and like, it makes sense. I mean, I like the berry to eat, right. but I just don't want to eat yeah. the barnyard dirt. Floor. Well, yeah, I mean, you would drink French wine, right? You would just drink California wine. Because California wine is more the fruity stuff, right? Oh. But, you know, I can understand liking white wine versus red wine. What I can't understand it's like, I like white wine, but I don't like Chardonnay. Or it's like, I like white wine, but I don't like Riesling. That's another weird one. Because like Riesling can also be still, it can be sparkling, it can be dry, it can be sweet. Like there's so many different variations of Riesling. To just say, I don't like Riesling is like, come on. Like you, there's not one Riesling out there 
that you don't like, but you'll drink Sauvignon Blanc. Get the fuck out of here. Because I can promise you, I could find you a blind tasting Riesling that you would be like, oh shit. Is this Simon Young Block or is this recently? Like it could be very confusing. So again, I think people just regurgitate what they've heard. They've heard somebody else that's like more like successful than them. Yeah, well, her experience comes to her experience is mostly I tell her what's on the label and she tastes it and she's like, I don't like it. And then I'll force her to try one more, but I don't know anything about wine. So they could have two different labels, but they could be the exact same thing. And I would never know that. Right. So now she's well, like trying, if you have an oaky Chardonnay, yeah. which tastes like bourbon. And tastes I don't like completely bourbon. different than an unoak chardonnay, which tastes like Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. If she likes Sauvignon Blanc mm -hmm. and I give her an unoak chardonnay, she'd be like, "Oh, that's really good." But if I gave her like an oaky chardonnay that's a bomb, that tastes like bourbon and butter and popcorn, right? No, like, thank you. I don't things, like any of those. She's things. Like very rich. She tastes. She's like, "Yeah, I don't like chardonnay," right. because that's what she thinks chardonnay is. Is this is oak bomb bomb? But it doesn't have to be. Okay. You could buy an unoak chardonnay, which is you know so very pleasant. And before you leave. Give me two to try. Two Chardonnays mm -hmm. to try? Well, I don't really talk about brands because I'm not like trying to push a brand on you. Yeah, I, I would go I to your mean local. On the, I didn't mean on the podcast. Oh, you, but for the podcast, go okay. to your local wine shop. Okay. Wherever that is. Local wine shop, not your Lowe's or your right. Harris Teeter. Go to a local wine store. Find the wine specialist there, wine okay. nerd. They are going to love to talk to you and say, I want to try an unoaked Chardonnay. Give me two unoaked Chardonnays. Okay. And that would be for your, from what I've got to know in the last 30 minutes, hour, whatever. That's probably what you would like. Now, if you're a bourbon guy, maybe you go to the store and you go, I want your oakiest Chardonnay that you have. Mm -hmm. And I'd like your most unoaked Chardonnay you have. We're going to okay. go home together and we're going to try these. Because an oaked Chardonnay by a campfire is like tits for me. Like, dude, it's buttery. It's oh thick, my God. caramely. Like, I'm like, <laughs> dude, I could drink this shit. Really? You know, all night. You know, it's, it does way more for me than than a cab or, or something like that. Now, if I'm having steak and I'm sitting inside, you know, maybe some red wine. But, you know, watch Shadow Montalena and, like, you'll have a whole new appreciation for what. I mean, not Shadow Montalena. The, the movie's called Bottle Shock. But you watch that movie, you'll have a whole other appreciation. But, you know, if you're a real wine nerd, you drink it all. You know, I mean, like, you learn to love it all. I guess it's kind of like coffee. You know, it's like you learn to love it all if you're a coffee nerd. Um, and so for me, I'll drink no, red I'm wine. No, I'm so picky wine. about my coffee. Yeah. See, I'll drink everything. But when it comes to wine, I'll drink everything. Red wine, white wine, sweet wine, fortified wine. I mean, whatever you brought me, I would find a reason to enjoy. Okay. So. I'm a positive person. And I appreciate that. Is that this one? I don't think you finished that one yet. I just love wine. And I love the process. So there's really not a wine that I've found that I just don't like. I, I, I don't like the wines that are just a marketing gimmick. And I'll call them out as being a marketing gimmick. And there are a bunch out there. But aside from that, that's the only thing that annoys me about wine. The the pretentious community. Oh. Or the pretentious part of the community. That wants you to only like very specific, very Yeah, I mean if anybody's like talking to you about like I drink this Jordan, that's all I drink. And they're a fucking loser. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's a boring human it's a boring existence. Yeah. Like there's Thousands and thousands of vineyards on the East Coast. Right. You don't want to venture out and taste all of them? Like, what if there's something, like, what if you're missing out on, like, the greatest thing that you've ever tasted in your whole life? <laughs>